Hello, everyone. Welcome to our case study. My name is Stefan Evers. I'm working for Bosch IO. And I'm Sven Eric Joszewski, also working with Bosch IO. We both participate in, in a study inside Bosch and also in a, it's more like a project that is trying to find the way forward for Bosch in the context of embedded GNU Linux. So uh, we want to give you a little bit of a background, what the situation is with Bosch, so you understand what uh, is behind this project. So the Internet of Things is actually something that's really important for Bosch because we have a lot of things that we are producing one way or the other in the different domains, in mobility, in industry, in building and kind of consumer goods. So that is all important for us. And all these devices are becoming these days connected, which is actually a big change. As part of this project, we have done uh, some uh, holes inside Bosch and to identify what actually the situation is and what the amount of devices is that we are talking about. And it turned out that in 2025, we uh, can expect that Bosch is actually producing more than 50 million devices per year based on Linux, which is quite a big number. And all these different devices are actually right now, they're not done with one, one way or one uh, type of Linux distribution or anything like that. Many of them are done in different ways. So now we have the big challenge that we have to find out how should we go into the future and how should we do that in the future? And it, we realized talking to many other companies, we are not the only one. Many have exactly this challenge, a, a rising number of devices based on Linux and also the connection of the devices to the internet. So like, let's first have a look at how the approach is with embedded software uh, creation. So for that, Sven will tell us a little bit about it, Sven. Thank you, Stefan, for this uh, nice introduction. So what I will tell you in the next couple of minutes is the situation that we've perceived during our project in a couple of different embedded software pro projects, or the creation of software for those devices. So of course, since this is a case study, this is more like a generalization of the different topics, but uh, since this is what we're aiming for with this talk, so the first thing that you typically come across when you have these embedded software projects is you have these different layers. So the first layer that you can see on the left-hand side of the slide is the hardware support. So uh, this starts with the hardware and also how is the hardware supported in software. So mainly drivers are they included in the mainline kernel. How do I do that? Do I need to write my own drivers? All these things. Next level would be the software-based system. So the question is, what is the actual base or the foundation of my software running on the system? Uh, if you go up to the next layer, you sometimes have uh, add-on software, which is still more like on an infrastructural level, for instance, uh, integrating with different software distributions mechanisms, but it's a bit above the base layer. So this is where we differentiate here with the add-on software. The uh, thing that's now coming more into this project is also the layer of runtime services. So with the approach of, uh, of IoT or Internet of Things devices, um, you more or you have to take more care of integrating your devices with uh, overall architectures, be it in the cloud or some other systems. So you need some clients on your devices to integrate with, with those backends, and this can be substituted with runtime services. And a really important thing, and which sometimes tends to be forgotten, is the question of tooling. So to enable developers to do all the other layers that I just mentioned in a really nice and efficient and maybe even fun manner. So think, look, looking at the embedded software project now, what the, the task of the developers in this project and also the managers and product designers and everyone else is to deliver a specific device and a specific, specific solution to the customer that somehow differentiates on the market and somehow has benefit for the um, customer in the end. And the way they do it, they have this embedded software project trying to take all the different components from third parties, self-developed, maybe open source, maybe not open source, 
and try to integrate this in the embedded software project. So it's a huge task to actually come up with this whole integration and selection and making sure that everything fits together to then come up with the device software. So the software that's actually running on the device, be it the firmware, nowadays also included with an update mechanism, which is really important, how to integrate the add-on software, backend clients, and obviously also how to provide the extra functionality, the extra value to the customer, which then works on top of all these layers that, that I just mentioned here. Another thing which sometimes tends to be, to be forgotten a bit when you just talk about technology, this also needs to be more in a compliant manner so that you really know which components are in your system that you can track so that you can um, react to vulnerabilities, that you also know that all the license requirements are met in your software. So this is also that you have really to take care of. So going to the next slide, um, this is a situation that uh, those development teams typically tend to find them to themselves in, in. So they have to focus on something, of course, every time you need to focus. But the question is, what is the thing you focus on? And uh, in a typical uh, project that we've seen, you, you tend to focus on the build phase. And this is the phase of actually creating the thing or the device or what you try to create in a more short-term way with a specific deadline in mind. So in our case, often this deadline or has been this are called SOP or start of production. So by that day, the day you start producing your devices and you also start sending them out to your customers, you have to make sure that the software is up and running in a stable way. So this is one of your main short-term goals. So you start maybe again with the whole project, you try to control your costs also for your hardware that you get into. So then you also have um, try to somehow differentiate with your customer uh, competitors uh, to bring more value to your customers. So this way um, you also focus on these features and also, I mean, many developers love to develop features, they'd have to develop new things. So they tend to also go into this feature development thing. So one way to achieve this during the whole build thing is that you try to make use of your local flexibility. So you try to avoid external dependencies because you don't want to talk to external, to align with external communities, be it really in the open world, be it with another department, be it with another division. It's always more flexible to just do it on your own machine, like works on my machine. So works on my device, works on my con concrete example or specific example. But this is perfectly fine if you build something up, but um, you end up with a couple of risks and these risks, uh, many of those can be summarized with one term, which would be maintenance. So, once you have your product in place, you still need to focus and need another focus, which would be now the maintenance. And this sometimes it's maybe not that much fun than building something because you already have it, but you still need to spend a lot of effort in developing your software technology and also the software on your device. So you otherwise you might have end, end up in a situation where you plan something, where you build something like a, like a house and it completely changes its purpose or its behavior or how it looks like over time. And this is something that you have to react on, or maybe in some cases also you have to prevent this from happening um, because otherwise you have a lot of effort to um, follow this. So one approach to do this would be um, reusing results to also share this maintenance and also to make sure that your specific components fit in the overall evolving ecosystem. So um, this is kind of difficult sometimes because as I said earlier, to gain flexibility, it's often easier to solve your problems locally. So this might end in the situation that you solve them redundantly. So there's another benefit in actually upstreaming these changes or these uh, developments that you made to get more in a core development mode. Um, which is obviously hard if you don't focus on the maintenance, but if you actually uh, tend to focus on the build phase, because after your first device, you just continue building the next device and the next device, and over years, you have a larger stack of things that you want to 
or would need to work on, but you kind of miss a focus to go into this maintenance track um, and actually do the things um, in a proper upstreamed manner. So maybe coming into one reason or a situation why this is difficult to shift this focus is on our next slide. Um, just take one slide, here we go. Um, it's, it's get out in the shoes of a product team starting a new production. And what they typically have, they go into a room and decide, okay, we do things like this, these, these features, and we estimate a certain number or capacity or cost or time or however you want to measure that for specific things. And often you tend to underestimate uh, certain efforts if you're more focused on the build phase. One thing is the effort for the actual system integration and system development. So every team, every developer is developing a single component, but now you don't have enough time or um, resources to do the actual integration, the nitty gritty details of every, getting everything run on the device. Again, also in a compliant manner. Um, this even becomes a harder topic um, if you go to the Internet of Things, because um, with the Internet of Things, you definitely increase the attack surface to your devices by a lot, because now basically everyone somehow has internet, access to the Internet has theoretically access to your device. So you really want to make sure that these people cannot get into your device, because no one wants your light bulb taking part in a DDoS attack while you sit in the living room. Um, so that's something that sometimes can be underestimated, especially in the long run, if you talk about the maintenance again. Over the whole product life cycle, which is also yeah, one of the another risk in general that you tend to neglect these long-term effects because you first want to come up with some features and some value in the first place. And then it's also often underestimated how much effort you have actually to spend into maintaining those proprietary elements or those differentiating features or this feature that you consider differentiating. But in the long run, you maybe come up with the um, observation that all the effort that you have to spend to adapt to the changing system environment around you is maybe not the benefit that you get out of that, but this is something that you just realize when it's maybe too late or later on. Um, so maybe to come up with a comparison, uh, it feels sometimes that uh, people in this room plan for an 800 meters run, they know the goal, it's somewhere visible, we need a lot of things to do, but it's, you can do it in a fast pace. And once they reach the finish line, they realize, hmm, actually the finish line is a 10K. So it's uh, almost 10 times the, the distance. So we have to go all the maintenance. We have to shift our focus to being more in an endurance and reliable mode. And once you come to this realization, you might come up with, and no one wants people uh, to become frustrated, but so we need to find a way to avoid such situation. We just drown in all these different issues of keeping up with uh, updates of all these different dependencies, be it something that you got from an um, external distributor, be it, just, be it an open source project, be it something that you bought somewhere, be it uh, some outdated components, be it that you maybe um, underestimated the effort for system integration that, that I just mentioned. And this even this increased this um, feeling or the situation because you missed out on the opportunity to share this um, topics, like to share this complexity, to share this effort or to go on a mode of co-innovation because early on you lost your focus on the maintenance or did not have the time and the, maybe also the reasons to shift into this maintenance mode. And this is definitely a risk that you can run into. Uh, again, I'm not saying that every project is always going this path, but there's the possibility and we have seen it sometimes in some ways. So this was enough to, for us to come to this conclusion that we might need uh, to change things in this uh, front and on this regard and to come up with a project on how to change the, um, this, how the system development is done and how to enable the developers from these really specific teams. Again, they are really focused on their domain and their device to come more in this more collaborative mode and to enable them in their work. And this, the 
progress that we have made during that process. That's something that Stefan will talk about in the next minutes. Yeah, thank you, Sven. That was a very good and detailed description of like uh, all the problems that we identified uh, that I think not only Bosch, but the typical industrial companies are facing uh, these days with embedded devices. So you have to keep in mind, like uh, if, if you're someone that have uh, done a lot of open source development, that still a lot of this embedded software development um, for specific devices is done behind closed doors, like on this slide, on this uh, picture. It's um, because they're very focused on getting uh, things done before the actual production of the device starts. So, and uh, we have been thinking about uh, how can we actually face this shift that it's becoming more and more important that the maintenance is done in an efficient way and not only focus on the build part of the device with this very complex situation coming up as described. And for us, it's become more and more aware looking at that than opening up this process and uh, do it more in a collaborative way inside and also outside of the company um, might be a good way out. And so we were thinking about like uh, what, what, how, how can you actually foster this collaboration? And what does it actually need? That was like one of our intermediate results. And we would love, of course, to hear your feedback about all this. But yeah, we just want to show you what now for us at the moment is uh, the current uh, result. So internal needs to actually foster the collaboration. How can we do that? And uh, what does it need? We came to the conclusion that a cross-divisional service organization would actually help because it's bringing these different projects closer together and helping them to find synergy she's between shared parts. So meaning if one project is using something and the other project is using the same thing, um, if there is like a service organization um, that would help, either even external or an internal one, both uh, is possible. And also it would help if such a service organization would be there um, that a new project can start on all the things that already have been uh, um, understood that it needs to be done like uh, one way or the other or in particular for the corresponding situation so that they can just start, fa uh, start faster. And also all the tooling that you need, um, which is quite a lot. If you just look at testing or like uh, the, all the different ways to store the code or also do the integration and all these things, um, it's uh, quite a bit already. And also um, to maintain that and set that up is actually, it's quite some work. So that would also help if there would be an infrastructure as long as it fits. Of course, you, you always have to make sure that each individual project are not, uh, let's say, uh, put too much in a box, meaning that they lose the ability to just use and set up what they need. And uh, so that is um, very much important that uh, you keep that in mind. Um, a second thing is that there is already in these big companies a lot of knowledge and know-how around these topics, but it's really hard to get that coordinated that actually this is shared across all the different parts of a big organization and uh, spread. And uh, that would help to do that, to do a coordinated approach to make that more like help this Linux community inside a company like ours to, to, uh, to do that. A third measure or a third need is actually what we think, a more and coordinated participation in the Linux ecosystem. So there needs to be ways or we need to find ways to foster that, to push that. Um, and we are also looking at that. Externally, we were looking at uh, three different things. 
So externally, um, the, the goal, I think, of not only of us, but of many is now how to improve this IoT support uh, for Linux devices. And uh, this is like, a, there, there are these three dimensions that always come up. It's hardware support and software and tooling. And uh, the goal that would be great um, is actually to get in different areas an improvement and that is wonderful. One is like transparency, for example, through certification that it's becoming obvious, like when you have, for example, a certain uh, service provider, um, for example, in which way he is um, making sure that all the results, all the changes that he's doing to the corresponding open source software is actually getting upstream. Or how he is providing, for example, if it is a hardware vendor, how he is providing um, the corresponding drivers in the mainline kernel or anything like that. So that it's becoming easy to maintain that over time. Another thing, of course, is standardization. So it, the entire embedded Linux area, there is still a lot of room to standardize the things. So it's becoming easier and reducing the complexity for the individual projects. Of course, it would also be great if many of the things that uh, are done redundantly currently for many reasons, uh, if we find ways to share that and uh, make it more efficient, the same is true for testing. One thing that is uh, turned out to be really important is traceability. So that you know exactly what uh, component is on which device or where this is coming from and that, uh, that you can do that and handle it on a large scale. Um, that is uh, helping a lot for if you, for example, use a, a Linux distribution or um, instead of like doing it very customized for each individual de uh, um, device. The other thing is when you do that, then you have components and you can share the metadata for the corresponding components and uh, like handle that uh, in a larger scale manner. Um, for example, with licenses and vulnerabilities. And the third one is the uh, for future devices. So when something new is coming up, it would be great that it's easier for an out of the box solution that are like already following and doing all these things. We at Bosch, we use something and develop something that's called the Pertus that is to a certain extent fulfilling our needs. And we already also published it um, on a website uh, like a Pertus.org. But uh, we don't expect that everyone uh, like is like happy with that one. But uh, like anyone who is interested, of course, can use it. On the other hand, we think that is something that uh, would be useful in general. And what we heard from many other companies are doing actually something like that. They have developed something like that that is helpful. And uh, doing it for new devices is like a, a great way to do it. The second part of the results is that we that all this what I just discussed opening up more doing more collaboration in this way what we think what is needed is actually for a company like ours and cultural change in many areas. And um, if you want to do it this way it uh, has certain requirements you need strategic goals, so you get the corresponding funding and the corresponding support management attention and uh, also the corresponding time. Um, so like open source goals need to become the strategic goals um, to support the corresponding business goals. And the developers need to have the time to learn the skills and uh, do the corresponding things that are enabling them to do this new uh, to do these things in this new kind of manner in this new culture. And of course, they also have to struggle with certain barriers um, that they need to overcome. So it's also important that they give this, that they get this time and that they get the corresponding support to overcome that. Because it means doing that in, a, in this different kind of way, um, working more out there in the open, in these open source communities that they have to leave to their comfort zone or something unknown so far. And also it is, because it's new, um, somehow uncertain what does the corresponding actions have for consequences for them and also for the company. 
So it is uh, like it takes some time to do these changes. So this cultural change is something that is really difficult in general. Like every cultural change in a big company is something that takes time and uh, also takes uh, energy and uh, patience. But I think um, from what we've seen, it, uh, it would be worth it to do that. So how can we do that concrete in detail? So what would be first steps towards that? We also thought about that. And establishing the participation in the OS open source community as a new normal, it would take um, these concrete measures here, train the open source skills, encourage open source activities, um, like incentive wise, and also like, uh, instead of making it hard to go into corresponding conference and giving talks and visiting the events, making it easy. And also providing the corresponding experienced mentors from externals or when you have them, hire them and uh, also have them internally. And of course, removing the barriers that we just talked about. A third thing that we uh, came to that we think would help is actually what we call something like an industrial grade Linux, at least that's what we think. Meaning introducing something like two additional layers between these upstream software um, that is there and the embedded software project. We already have in many cases, uh, in many projects already a service provider that is helping us to do many things um, like for example, in the open source space. And uh, so that is already there. But in many cases, uh, what we see is actually the things that we are doing are actually not really um, getting to the corresponding upstream projects or it's getting somehow lost or the next project has to start anew. That's the reason why we think it might be really helpful to have something like another open source community that is focusing very much on the embedded uh, Linux area. For example, we see something like civil infrastructure project, which is already a, a great thing. And there are also many other activities, but um, we think there's still something missing. And it would be interesting to talk about how, uh, if this is true and how, if this is true and, and many people think like that, how we can close this gap. Yeah, so that is more or less like, what we have learned. And uh, I hope this is helpful for other people. And we would love to discuss that thing. And we thank you a lot for giving you, uh, giving us your attention. And uh, so if you have any feedback, and if you want to discuss, we would love to hear. So actually, we also asked some of our colleagues if they could give us like a little statement or like uh, um, what they think, um, like they're sharing their experience. So that it's all not only us, we are just representing some people out of this context. And so we will, we will add this to this video, uh, two statements that uh, we got. We like them, we hope you like it too. And uh, yeah, Sven, if you have anything to add, um, you can also like uh, bring that out now. Um, anything? Thank you very much. Um, and the only thing I would like to add is I'm really looking forward to making developing Linux-based devices even more fun and also maybe even more efficient. So looking forward to the journey. Yeah. And again, I already said it, but I cannot emphasize it this enough. We would really love to hear from you. We would love to um, discuss this with you. If uh, hearing your insights, your understanding, uh, maybe what we said, you don't share this view. It would be interesting to hear uh, what you see differently. But also, of course, when you say, uh, think, Yes, this is true. This is also an interesting uh, feedback. So please contact us and have a nice open source summit. Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm Chris from Bosch Power Tools. I'm software architect here and I want to share some experience that I made during the last years of Linux development within Bosch. So some years ago, we started as an organization to shift from microcontroller-based software development to Linux processor-based software development. While this was quite new to us, we tried in the beginning to create our own images 
from scratch and we had to build up all this build infrastructure and all this open source disclosure stuff and everything and we recognized after i think one or two years we recognized it is much more than just hacking some software to, uh, together because there's so much process and everything that you need um, and we recognized that we need some additional help uh, and we tried to get in contact with external partners and to contract something but this was also not maybe the right thing for us so we tried to join forces within Bosch itself and this was definitely a game changer at that time because on, on one hand of course it was a cost sharing that we had but um, what we actually did was we were jumping on a platform of a bigger part in, inside Bosch who had uh, had the same experience in the past and they were very open to help us and um, what was nice about their platform approach was um, the part that being a Debian system, which uh, helped us to get very quick and rapid prototyping. Uh, a part of that was that they had this open source mindset. So it was not this typical industry style platform where you have uh, lots of requirements engineering in the, in the beginning and then you form a platform and everybody has to take it. It was the other way around. It was true open source. It was like uh, there is something, you can take it, you can adapt it, you can upstream it back. You are always able to deliver. You don't have to wait for anything. And this was a true game changer. This change in mind um, from this stiff platform development approach, one fits all, to this idea of um, being open for multiple different requirements or multiple different units having completely different work styles uh, but still having one aggregate where you can upstream and this was really great so we after half a year we were able to get really into production mode um, and to do our products and now we have our first products in market working on this platform and this is great so the key message of this is um, be open for open source, um, even if you are industry. And industry and open source fits very well together, but um, it's don't try to adapt open source to your industry style working, but try to adapt your industry style working to open source style. It's much, much more agile. You can um, read so much more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dirk. As a project manager, I'm responsible for an ecosystem for IoT development based on embedded Linux. And now I'm going to show you where I live. I live close to a forest. I love to live here. And this, this is my fence. It is important to protect my property by a fence and additionally I have Nero, my German Shepherd. At my property Nero and me, we have clear rules for the family and the guests. Outside, in the forest, it is different. The forest is open and you never know who you meet or what you will discover there. For Nero, the forest is an opportunity to meet other dogs or to hunt deers. And I like to meet people of my community people who love dogs and love the forest. In early June, I crossed this fence and met a neighbor. She told me about a doctor where a family vaccination was possible on short notice. My family got vaccinated after two days and we enjoyed our summer holidays with full COVID protection. What would have happened or not happened if I was not in touch with my neighbor behind the fence? Okay, behind the fence it might be uncertain. Have you ever heard about wild boars, wild pigs living in the forest? However, I see a lot of chances, more chances than risks. And this is the reason why we are now going to cross the fence. Neo, come, cross the fence. <laughs> 